In the summer of 1977, my family moved to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to join a non-denominational Christian community called the Menominee River Fellowship and to reunite with a family we were friends with on the north side of Chicago. My father is a dedicated social worker and is a full-blooded Mexican-American who has little connection with his culture, mostly because of the lack of cultural diversity in the area we've lived in for almost four decades. He rarely speaks Spanish, but when he tries to speak with the waiters and waitresses of the local Mexican restaurant, I feel remorse that there are very few people of his heritage he can assimilate with. Likewise, I feel there may be a big part of my life that is missing, and I often wonder if I shouldn't move to a more diverse area. In sharp contrast to this empty feeling, the U.S. Census Bureau claims that Mexican immigration is on the rise and the population of the Mexican-American people in the future will be nation-changing. When my family moved to the tiny city of Menominee, Michigan, we were the only Latino family in town that I know of, and since then, little has changed. The Census Bureau states that whites now make up 69% of the population in the U.S., and low birth rates and immigration will reduce their percentage population in the next 40 years, bringing the total of whites to 50%. It is predicted the Asian and Mexican population will continue to grow and triple over the same time period, putting them in the majority in the year 2050. Even with this drastic increase, I wonder if the northern parts of the country will ever see an influx of Mexican immigration. I asked several fellow students to participate in a video experiment to see and hear what some white people from the North actually thought about the possibility of being a minority in the United States. Immigration of Mexicans and Asians will increase so greatly that it, it will uh, reduce the white population to minorities themselves. How, does it, how would that make you feel if that came true? I think that would make me really uncomfortable. It's surprising. I don't think it's. I don't think that's ever going to happen. That's what my initial thing is. I really don't believe that. I don't think that. I don't. Not not me. I don't care if they come here, but I'm pretty sure that um, there are people out there that wouldn't allow that even to happen. Like the government. Yeah. You think the government would step in and, and do something? I totally about believe that. Would yeah. probably what would happen. Who's to say we're not already the minority? I mean, it's not like. Um, when my ancestors came here and they were Belgian or they were German or they were Irish, well, then each of them were the minority. Well, then I guess I feel it's probably putting an undue burden on the U.S. taxpayers. We've become such so mixed in our race and our like ethnicities that I mean, most scientists probably figure that we're all going to end up just being one super race. The student who thought the government would step in is probably fairly insightful, looking historically at the control of Mexican-American immigration. It is easy to see the decline of allowance of legal migration. In 2003, the overall immigration admissions fell by one-third, and the number of visas authorized continues to decline. The booklet attributes this to the terrorist attacks on 9-11. I believe most recently, it is a side effect of dealing with the war on drugs and its impact on the border of Mexico. I spoke with a Mexican man working on a visa at a local restaurant who said his family was living with him in the UP of Michigan since the early 90s. Recently, his daughter decided to go back to Mexico because the schools there were more accepting and diverse. He said he visits her often and told me the country is now ridden with drugs and gangs everywhere and worried for his daughter's safety because of the violence from the fighting drug cartels. I was shocked a young Mexican girl that was raised in the north of the U.S. was willing to risk the violent outbreaks of drug wars to be educated there and avoid the racial prejudice and discrimination that exists here. I also interviewed a Mexican-American woman from Arizona who had recently been through a custody battle with her ex-husband in Marinette, Wisconsin. Now this is A. Read this with me. You know, those little kind of 
it was hard to keep my composure up there with him and, and with my hus my ex-husband actually smirking and smiling and he's from here, he's from Kenosha, Wisconsin and he's Caucasian. When he had my ex-husband up there, he was just praising him. Where do you work at? Oh, that's a good job. Electri electrician, you gotta be very smart to work there. And in fact, he doesn't even have a high school diploma. And I was just like baffled because I'm right there too. And I had a part in that too, I would think, you know, just, mm -hmm. but it was just crazy. Like I wasn't even in the room. He would actually say, now shut up. You had your turn. When in fact I hadn't, I had no turn because every time I tried to say something, he would tell me to shut up and sit down. And uh, one time I, I got up to straighten my jacket and he told me, no, you were not done yet. You cannot leave. And I told him I wasn't leaving. I was just straightening out my jacket. Now shut up and sit down. I told you, shut up and sit down. And what are you going to do? You know, you cannot say nothing back to him because he's a commissioner. You need to be upstairs minding your own business, peeling potatoes, and making tortilla, what your people usually do. I couldn't even believe he said that. Could this be the effects of years of isolation from the rest of the country? Could it be fear of integration? Why would an occupationally challenged aging commissioner stick his neck out to racially and sexually degrade an outspoken minority in his court, knowing every word is being recorded? Where is the risk versus reward factor? It's simple. There is no risk. There will be no appeal. There will be no backlash. There will be no charges brought against this racist behavior. Why? Because the Mexican-American population is viewed by the media, government, and general populace as a problem. And whether one has lived in this country one's entire life or for 10 days, it is much easier to lump them all into the same group regardless of the individual's attempt to assimilate with society. Mexican or South American, whatever they call themselves. I looked at him and I say, go back to Puerto Rico. Just thinking that's probably where he's from. How do I know? He takes it as I'm calling him some kind of name. There are two issues that are rarely discussed that are contributing factors in the current Mexican immigration conflict. The first issue goes back well over 100 years probably just after the Mexican cessation of 1848, when the United States settled border issues in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. It has been portrayed in film, books, magazines, comics, songs, and television, and I've never heard any mention of this in any classroom. When the criminals in the U.S. were on the lam, robbed banks and workplaces, and made off with American monies, where did they go to, to escape the long arm of the law? Where have they historically made their escape route? Where could they go to live like kings from the stolen cash and goods? Where was the border open to any American without question? Trying to get my friends old Mexico. We Mexico. Need some pesos. No one mentions the possibility of the haven for U.S. criminals accumulating to the brink of government corruption. No one ever talks about the evil that has left this country to go to Mexico to try to be a king, a mayor, sheriff or the leader of a drug cartel. No one ever mentions that the U.S. has been flushing its perpetual toilet and the drain leads right below us. To all the girls I've loved before who've traveled in and out my borders. These, all these poor white folk, old retirees that have lived there their entire life, it's strictly predominantly white, and then we get an influx of Mexican. And if I'm ridiculed for telling a Mexican you, know, you should know how to make tortillas, you're Mexican, why not? The second issue is the war on drugs, or really the war on Latin American drug cartels. Since World War II, there have been refugees of war victims of displacement when the violence created by war causes people to flee their native homeland. The U.S. has seen its share of refugees, but oddly enough, when the war is right next door, something changes. When the cherished neighbors who supply the country with all kinds of goods the U.S. demands, from food to drugs, to clothing to cheap labor, and a refuge from our mundane lives, 
when they need a place of solace to retreat to. We are not accepting refugees on the war of drugs. We have abused the border, its people, and used places like Tijuana and Nogales as a place to misbehave outside our borders. We treat the people like slaves, barter down prices to the absolute worth, not allowing them to make a dime, and trash the environment when we retreat in Cabo San Lucas, Acapulco, and Cancun for our spring breaks and winter vacations. Yet, when they need a place to retreat from an ever-growing hotbed for criminals, we turn our backs and close Being the a doors. White person, you want to know what we have to go through? It's serving somebody of color, a black man, an Asian man, and having to over uh, to do everything to make sure that they feel comfortable and they feel okay. All the while, they're just looking at you snickering like, yeah, that's right, white boy, get on it. I am, I am colored. I have that right to be able to look at you and you better snap to it because if you don't, I will call racism. I will, just because the color of my skin, that's why you gave me bad service. Not because you're a dumbass, but because of the person's race. I think because of my name, Sir Rebecca Chandler would call me and because they saw what I look like, I think it was just immediate reaction to the way I looked, what my name was. They got people out in, in trailer parks making meth, their meth labs, um, their weed is growing right now is better than you're going to get some Mexican press weed stuck up a Mexican's ass. Did you, did you need some drugs? You, you need something, Holmes? Can I, can I get you something? You need some cocaine? Some marijuana? I look like uh, Maria Lopez. So if you would hire me on that and my experience until when I walked in, there's a lot of people that would ask me, well, as soon as they saw me, what, what, what are you? Hello, senor. Que pasa, senor? What can I cook for you today, senor? A lot of people would come up to ask me, do you got your papers to work here? Do you speak English? You're married to him? Or I didn't expect him to be your husband. Or And I don't know where people get off asking those kind of questions or how the nerve comes up to ask those kind of questions. Not hi. Like, like, like what nationality are you? Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Like, well, hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. What's your name? Good morning, how are you? No. What's your nationality? <laughs> People wouldn't even come to my window because of my nationality. They put me here for just the Mexican cook. Two dollars, senor. Two dollars only. Two dollars. Okay. A dollar fifty. A dollar. It's, it's a lot of oranges for a dollar. No? Come on, man. Look at this, man. Ay, 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 caramba. What's your name, man? Whatever you need, I'm gonna bring it to you. To all the girls I've loved before. Ah, cucaracha. Yeah, people ask me, where, where at in Mexico are you from? Not from Mexico. Not from Mexico. Arizona. Which is fine. I, I don't. I don't mind that. But just, do you have your papers? What papers are you talking about? I have all my shots too. I'm, I'm legal. Well, I think some of my greatest strengths are. Uh, I, I've really excelled at uh, English. I, I can speak English fairly well, and but uh, also I, you know, I can mow your lawn for you too, man. I worked at Walmart, and that was the hardest day. And there was a girl there that said something about her brother moving to Florida, and how she don't know how he could live there with all those kind of people, different kind of people. Well, why don't we have coffee together? And maybe you could get to know us kind of people. Well, they're really not that bad. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were there. I didn't mean for you to hear me. Que paso, homes? What's happening? I do a pretty good job, too. I can trim your shrubberies. It was hard, and I came out crying every night. I wanted to go move back home. And people aren't as friendly as they are in Arizona here. And I can shovel your walk when it's snow. Oh, wait a minute, it doesn't snow there. What am I thinking? 
I can. Well, I, I, I guess that's pretty much all I can do is, is mow the lawn and, and trim the shrubs, you know. I don't know, me personally, I don't know that it would affect necessarily anything that I do. There's two million legal Mexicans living in the United States. Do you feel that that's kind of controversial or um, accurate to what you know about Mexican immigration? Sure. I, I'm not surprised. When my ancestors came here and they were Belgian or they were German or they were Irish, well, then each of them were the minority. Well, then, you know, the Chinese people came and then they were the minority. And then um, maybe some Japanese people came and they were the minority. And then they're all lumped together. And then uh, Mexicans came, which were just Spanish descent, which is just the same thing as people from Northern Europe just going to Southern, you know what I mean? It's just, it's one big kind of thing, who cares? In some odd way, you know, maybe I've felt superior because I am white, or at least I have some sort of a privilege. Like I have an edge. My personal experiences with prejudice and discrimination are lengthy, but mild in comparison to some stories told, but do include violence, slander, eviction, undue praise, ridicule, educational disruption, employment denial, credit denial, robbery, harassment, and vandalism. I am not a perfect human being. I've made some mistakes in my life, none I wouldn't openly discuss and feel some regret. Is that a reasonable excuse for injustice? I am a half Mexican American, half German Irish American white man with a beautiful tan and a Wisconsin accent. And I wonder how perfect I would have to be to be looked at as a fully accepted, full blooded, brown, red, white, and blue. North American Western Hemispherian Earthling, just like everyone else in America wants to look like in July. I'm guessing the contributing factors are my name and the depth and ease of my tan that upsets so many people. I'll get on that right away. <laughs>